All right, you're listening to KPOO, and if you're listening right now, that means you're listening on KPOO.com. Unfortunately, our satellite is out, so we can't broadcast terrestrially, but fear not, because you may be listening to this in the future, in next week or so. It is October 1st today, so if you're not listening right now, don't worry about it. 89.5 is back on the air. I am joined right now by someone who I really appreciate coming on the show, and I, as soon as I saw this film, Project NIM, I had to I had to talk to you one way or another. I was going to send you an email, but it turned out you lived in San Francisco and everything worked together and you know, one of the things I love about social media is that you know, within uh a week I got you on the show through Facebook. So, thank you sir for coming on. Absolutely. Uh, My you, pleasure. Can you pull that a little closer? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. How's that? Um, it's pretty good. All right. All right. Yeah, you sound good. Thank you. Excellent. So, I saw this film, Project Nim, which, by the way, was directed, I didn't realize this until after, directed by James Marsh, who won an Academy Award for Best Director for... Man on Wire. For Man on Wire. Right, and that Simon was, Chin is the producer. Of, so Simon Chin and James Marsh worked together on that Man on Wire, and I think 2009 won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. I've seen parts of Man on Wire, not the whole thing, but uh, just from seeing Project Nim, I, I realized that these were very good documentarians. I'm a somewhat of a documentarian myself, but haven't been quite as successful. <clears throat> well, James actually uh, does not just documentaries. Uh, does he James do? and Simon both do uh, narrative films? projects. Okay. Uh, right now, uh, Simon is involved in uh, Searching for Sh- Sugarman, which is uh, a film out about a, a rocker, a rock star from Detroit who wasn't a rock star here in the United States, but uh, turned out to be a big uh, hit in South Africa, and that film's out right now. Oh, I did hear about that. Very, very good film, and, and the music. I didn't realize they were making a film on it. Well, well, actually, uh, I think what happened was uh, uh, the film was made, and Simon heard about it, and what he did was he, uh, I think, he got involved that way. So he's part of the the distribution now. Mm-hmm. Well, these are obviously you know great filmmakers. Absolutely. So let me get into let me introduce you. This if you haven't seen this film, by the way, you must you must watch it. It's it's Netflix. It's probably on uh, you know Showtime. I think it's on iTunes. iTunes. Oh, they're always on iTunes. But you know you can get it wherever any any store. And also ProjectNim.com, I think, is the right. Okay. Right. So Nim Chimpsky was born. He's a he's a chimpanzee. Right. He's a chimpanzee. He was born in 1973 uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, at the Institute for Primate Studies, where uh, ongoing primate research, chimpanzee research, was going on. Uh, and at that time, uh, when Nim was born, Roger Fouts, who worked with Washoe, the first sign language chimpanzee, was actually in residence there as well. There was one before Nim. Right, okay. exactly. So Washoe uh, was actually the first chimpanzee that learned sign language in, in actually in Reno, Nevada, uh, with a couple named the Gardeners, Beatrice and Alan Gardner. And uh, Roger was one of their students. Well, when that project ended in 1969, Roger moved to Oklahoma, to the University of Oklahoma, where he continued his studies with uh, Washoe. And so in 1973, Nim was born, and a a professor at Columbia University wanted to replicate the study with Washoe. Herbert Terrace. Yeah, Herbert Terrace, Dr. Herb Terrace. And so he acquired uh, uh, Nim Chimsky when he was two weeks old and attempted to teach him sign language over the next four and a half years or so. And he, one of the first interesting things was uh, Stephanie Lafarge was the first kind of mother figure to Nim. She took him into her New York, you know, apartment or house or... Right, well, I believe she lived in a brownstone with her family with, uh, I think, seven or eight kids and her husband. uh, His name was Weir, uh, a poet from uh, New York, and... uh, uh, Stephanie had had a little bit of experience with chimpanzees in the past, and, and he, she was a student uh, at one time or another of Herb's. So he recruited her because she not only was academically uh, you know, in, in the right ballpark, but she also was a mother. And so uh, you know, he needed someone that understood the project, you know, at least rudimentarily, a- and also was a good mother. And so Stephanie was, I think, a good choice. Do you? I, 
Uh, well, I, I don't think it w- was a choice I would make, but if you could have you know, been worse, yeah, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. So uh, I think that Stephanie did the best she could under the circumstances. She was, you can see from the from the film, which is it's really funny at times because you have this, uh, you know, year old chimp running around a house with five, six people in it and a German shepherd. It's, it, it, I New mean, York. obviously, uh, it's it looked like fun. It's working. I mean, it was fun. She wasn't so great at signing, but that's another, that's what she said in the film. Like, you know, she had new signs that she kind of just made up on her own. Well, chimpanzees do that as well. So, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the need to communicate uh, is great, especially amongst uh, people that are living together. So, uh, so making up signs or or using signs that you invent it, it isn't uncommon right so we'll get into that in a in a few minutes so dr herb terrace recruits several people at one point he takes nim away from the first teacher right. or mother figure right. so after about a year uh the project didn't have a lot of structure and right. herb wanted to have more structure so he wanted to move nim to a classroom situation at Columbia University. And so over the course of a few months, I, I, I wasn't there, so I don't really know the details. But I, I guess what happened was Stephanie was relieved of duty, mm-hmm. and uh, then uh, an, another woman uh, named Laura Ann Petito uh, took over the mothering role, let's say, as Nim got older. And then Stephanie was kind of... Uh, sidelined let's say right and the whole concept behind dr terrace's project his experiment was could he wanted to know could a chimpanzee through sign language form an actual sentence well that's what he said later i'm not so sure he said that at the beginning that's a good point but uh later on uh once he had collected i don't know quite a lot of data i i think he kind of changed the rules as he went along and i don't think that that's necessarily a fair thing so I, i'm not sure he was looking for sentences at the beginning right and that wasn't stated at the beginning and so i, I i'm not so sure about that uh, i i certainly think that the sentences are are interesting and important in language mm-hmm. but first things first does does he understand words and that was i mean and that's clear. Proven, very clear. Yeah, no, no, about no it. question about it. He not only understands words, he used them correctly, he, he used them spontaneously, and he used them in non-imitative situations. Uh, whether or not he made sentences, grammatically correct sentences, is a whole other question. I mean, and so, you know, when he asked the the question, can a chimpanzee use sign language, uh, yes. That that's still up in the air. Whether or not he does sentences or not, yeah, that that's you know uh, I'm not so sure that that's as interesting as whether or not he can name an object. Mm-hmm. And if he can name an object, like that's a glass, that's a piece of paper, that's a shirt, that's food. Um, yeah, my dog can't do that. Right, my cat can't do that. I don't think any other non-primate can do that. I, I can't think of another animal that that can make arbitrary symbols no. that represent uh, an object. It, it's astounding. Right. Now and then. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Herb said later was that Nim was – Nim only figured out how to beg. And if you think about it, Nim was two, three while this was going on, two, three years old. That's what any kid would do is beg. I mean I beg and I'm uh, yeah, seven. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I find that, that actually amusing. And I think that when you see the film, almost anybody that's used language and everyone has uh, – uh, or, or most they everyone has. It, it's right. it's yeah. pretty obvious that that most of what we do is ask for things, requests, right. begging. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, okay. Well, so what? I mean, he he's an eloquent beggar. I think is what Herb uh, said, and and that may be true. But that that doesn't discount the he's begging, and my dog doesn't use words to beg. He barks. Mm-hmm. You know. I don't have a dog. Actually, I have a cat. Me too. Um, so at a certain point after a year or two, he was, Nim was brought by the professor to a very large estate, 28 acres, I believe. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, Delafield, which was the, uh, owned by the, uh, Columbia University. It was at one time the president of the university's home. And so they had a giant estate and a giant, uh, house with many bedrooms and, and, 
as you can see in the film, because there's quite a lot of archival footage from those days, it, it had to have been a real blast. It was. You to could hang see. out. Oh, yeah, mo most definitely. And I've now uh, become friends with most of those people. Joyce Butler is a good friend of mine, and mm -hmm. and uh, we, we uh, talk all the time. And uh, and those folks, uh, Renee Fallis, the woman that ends up uh, having a, you know, something happen to her in the film, that, oh, right. that kind of changes the whole direction of their project. But they all loved Nim, and no question about it, they had a really, really good time. It, it, it's too bad they didn't know as much about chimps as they needed to know in order to be able to deal. But they, they did the best they could under the circumstances. So let's talk about that. So you were working at the Institute of primate studies, which Nim was born at, but were you even there when he was born? No, I wasn't actually. I was I was in the military in 1973, and oh, wow. uh, I was just about to finish and, and get out of the military, and that was a pretty turbulent time in, in America. So I was looking to get as far away from the military as I could and to go to college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happened to hear about uh, Roger and, and Washoe uh, in 1974, uh, on my journey uh, to Oklahoma, uh, I, I ended up at the University of Missouri, Kansas City for a year, and that's where I heard about the sign language with chimps. And so in 1974, I ended up in Norman, Oklahoma, where uh, Roger Fouts happened to be, and he happened to be my first professor uh, of my first class at the University of Oklahoma, and, and he was the, the chimp guy. So I approached him and said, hey, I want to work with these chimps. And... So that's where I started. Nim was already in Oklahoma. I mean, in New York, and, right. and uh, so I had a few years to kind of get up to speed with chimps before Nim came back. That was really helpful because when you see this film, you'll notice that I'm just going to jump ahead here. So Nim, yeah, sure. Nim is ta <clears throat> Nim is taken from this uh, 18, 20 acre estate and brought back to the place because, according to the to the doctor who was running the experiment and some of the other teachers, Nim was getting too big, and he did attack a couple. Well, Nim he was bit, acting more like a chimp than a human. Which Nim bit a few people, right? And uh, that's what chimps do, exactly. And, and uh, it's very dangerous, and and the liability. I believe he actually mentions the liability was too great, and the yeah. data was was not sufficient for his need. That I, I believe that's pretty close to what he said. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was he. Once there there was a, a severe bite, and Nim was the arrangement was made for Nim to come back to Oklahoma. So during that period of time, we knew about Nim. We'd heard Had about to have. you know. The I mean, we were in Oklahoma. Uh, wondering what was going on with NIM, and, and we had weekly meetings. You know, in graduate school, you meet with your major professors, and as a team, we, we worked together, so we would meet once a week, and NIM, NIM would come up, and, and when they decided to bring NIM back, of course, we got prepared. Mm -hmm. we, we were ready for this chimpanzee that bit just about everyone he came into contact with, and to us, that's just not acceptable. Because we work with chimps outside the cage, and we can't have them biting just anybody. So we were prepping for Nim to come back and, and be kind of a problem. And, uh, and so, uh, so I, I was, uh, amongst the people, the graduate students and other people in Oklahoma, anxiously waiting for Nim to come back, which he did. I am uh, speaking with Bob Ingersoll from the documentary Project Nim, a uh, very creative and very... Um Important documentary about one of the most important primates, in my opinion, in the last, you know, since humans have been around, really. The most I important interaction between a man and an animal, and his name was Nim Chimpsky. Uh, so back to the film. Now he's in Oklahoma. So in, in 1977, what happens is uh, that Nim's four and a half years old. He's bitten a, quite a few people. How much did he weigh at this point? He weighed uh, between 60 and 75 pounds. So uh, fairly big, but not as big as he was going to be. He at got the end very of his big. Life. Right. Uh, chimpanzees, the misconception is that chimps are small because no. most people see baby chimps. Chimpanzees can be up to 220, 230 pounds when they're uh, fully adult males. So uh, chimpanzees are, are not only that, they're six to ten times the strength of a human. So you're, you're dealing with a, a, a pretty serious challenge. Things. They have fangs as well. Oh, yeah. Well, those canine teeth are big, you know, but their teeth are like ours. They're just, you know, the canines are a, a bit bigger. And mm -hmm. uh, so when in 1977, in uh, I believe September, uh, no, uh, yeah, September of 1977, uh, Nim was returned 
to the Institute for Primate Studies where I worked with Roger Fouts. And uh, that's where I, you know, became acquainted with Nim. Actually, I met him the, the day that they came back from New York. See, the film doesn't show that. The film shows him coming to Oklahoma, and he's pretty much immediately very depressed about being in a cage for the first time in his entire life after uh, experiencing human contact for five years and not ever interacting with any other animals besides it looked like cats and dogs, but... And humans. And humans. Right. Uh, well, when, when Nim came back, he, he was was certainly uh, uh, wondering what was going on. And, yeah. and, I mean, it was obviously a change. And he came back with just a few of his old friends who only stayed for, I think, two days it, that's and, and the... left him alone with us who were strangers pretty much uh, and, and in a cage because he had to be uh in our situation at the institute our chimps lived in cages right and not in a house and didn't sleep in beds and they lived with other chimps so that that was a, a rude awakening let's say for nim and and he he immediately uh became extraordinarily depressed and what what we we see as depression and not uh, eating. Un- unfortunately for him, not eating, uh, you know, hanging his head low and 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 just looking sad, looking like uh, he had lost his best friend, which, which he had lost I a mean, lot of his best friends. At Joyce, once. Joyce and Bill were were, I think, as close a friend to Nim as possible. What about Laura? And if you see this film, you know what we're talking about. He he seems to kind of fall in love this this two or three year old chimp with, you know. A well, twenty-year-old woman. Yeah, absolutely. And, and chimpanzees can can show affection towards humans in that way. And and there's no question that that Laura and Nim ha- had a, a a strong bond and, and a strong relationship. Uh, and unfortunately for Laura, uh, she got involved in in other things in the project that precluded her from staying on the project. And and she had she removed herself and and went on to to her other academic work and and other people came on but yeah uh humans and chimpanzees can have very strong emotional bonds and it's very obvious in the film that quite a few people not just me but laura and bill and joyce and and uh even herb uh had very and of course jenny lee the uh stephanie's daughter they all had warm and loving relationships with this animal as if he were their brother or yeah a little son or something no question about it i wanted to just play a brief clip from the trailer of the film this is project nim i thought wouldn't it be exciting to communicate with the chimp and find out what it was thinking so why not teach him sign language and that's essentially why i started project nim I know nothing about chimpanzees. Herb wanted me to take Nim into my home as if he were a child. The fact that we could share language with an animal seemed very radical at that time. There was no family discussion. It was just, oh, we're having a chimp. We're going to teach a sign language. Nobody in the house really was fluent in sign language. Everything was about treating him like a human being. He liked alcohol. He loved driving fast in cars. I breastfed him for a couple of months. It seemed completely natural. I couldn't believe it. It was the 70s. Herb wanted a schedule and charted progress. I didn't supply that. There was utter chaos. There were no journals. There were no logbooks. This was a scientific project. I had an implicit faith that Nim would learn signs. I just mapped out a teaching plan for Nim, and I did it. Nim was learning signs rapidly. They're going up, 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 up. I could see I was succeeding. There was all this excitement and hype about the project. I had a relationship with a chimpanzee, and I had conversations with another species. gone from being this meek little huggable toy to a robust young chimpanzee. He's going to be big, five to six times the strength of a man. He's got fangs. This is 37 stitches. In that sense, he was becoming more chimp-like. It didn't seem to be a cause for alarm. I had never regarded him as a child. I regarded him as a scientific project. Nobody keeps a chimp for more than five years. I had the best time of my life. I've never had such a good time. Except maybe at a Grateful Dead show. 
All right, well, we'll end with that. A Grateful Dead fan is here, Bob Ingersoll. He's featured in the documentary Project Nim, which, I mean, I do see a lot of films, and um, I guess I'm a bit of a film critic. I get to come on here and talk about films, so I do talk about them. This is one of the best documentaries or films I've seen in 10 years. The, another great documentary that I talk about often, it was uh, When the Levees Break. It was about Hurricane Katrina. Spike Lee filmed I don't know if you've seen it. It's fabulous. It's four hours long, but it's... Yeah. It just takes a different view on things, which is what this film's all about. So we were just discussing, you basically just met Nim, 1977, and um, you make a statement in the film, you know, he's miserable in his cage, so I'm going to do whatever I can to, like, there's certain things that we can't control. He's going to be in a cage, you know, when he sleeps and things, but I'm going to take him. I'm going to get him out of the cage as much as I can. As much as possible. And that's what I did. And uh, every day, and every day I could, and uh, every day I could with other chimps, I took him out. And we, uh, we began to have a relationship that blossomed into, a, well, probably the biggest friendship of my life. Two questions that I meant to ask you earlier was, one, I forget the woman's name, but one woman said after the, or before the pretty big bite that he gave Renee, which sent her to the hospital, um, one trainer said... <laughs> Nim bit her, and she immediately, this woman, immediately bit him back on the ear, and he never bit her again. Right. Well, that's Joyce Butler. And, Joyce Butler. And, 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 and Is that genius. true? I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. So did Nim ever bite you? No. No, Nim never attempted to bite me, but I knew chimps fairly well. That's so the I could thing. anticipate the behaviors that, that like, uh, Proceed, let's say, a biting incident, and I, I could read chimpanzees fairly well. And male chimps are easy to read in terms of aggression. So when they're getting a little testy, if you just kind of calm things down and, and point out to them that hey, it, it could be a problem if you bit me, and so uh, that that didn't occur. Although you know there was testing going on in our relationship always. Right. There was never aggression. And that's a difference. The difference between testing and aggression. And, and Joyce Joyce is very very uh you know, she's smart. She understands that. And and uh Nim was testing her and uh she got an A because she immediately bit him back right on the ear and he never <laughs> bit her again. That's really and, interesting. And, and and their relationship was loving and, and so and, and it, it's obvious when you see Joyce and, and Nim in the film that that their relationship was was really rich and full of everything that you, you you could expect in a relationship between two people. There's a special feature on the DVD which I just found out last night. It's all about you. It's like a 10-minute documentary about you, but the thing that really grabbed me in this film was there's a point where and maybe it's just the storytelling of the documentarians, but there's a point where it looks like Nim has been by himself in that cage for a year without any interaction with human or you know any proper or what he's used to. But, and then the doctor Herb comes back for only a day and it's kind of like a TV appearance and Nim thinks he's going back to humans, you know, and leaving the thing. And then that's a pretty sad moment I feel like when he finds out he's not uh going to be going back to New York. But then the way the filmmakers make it appear is that, you know, then you start talking and, you know, you say, I'm going to hang out with him and make his life as best as it can. So it, it, the way the filmmakers made it look to me, it was basically Dr. Herb, you know, he got this whole thing started. He, Nim would have been in a cage most of his life had he never been taken out in the first place. Well, probably not. Actually, uh, w uh, the research that we conducted at the Institute for Primate Studies required most of the chimps to come out when they were youngsters. So they would have been involved in some kind of behavioral research. Okay. The, the reality is that Nim probably would not have been taken away from his chimpanzee mother. Right. That's which would sad. Have been, yeah. And that not only is sad, that, that's very problematic for chimpanzees because they learn everything from their mothers just like we do. <clears throat> and so and in the wild, chimpanzees stay with their mothers for between four and a half and five years before they even venture anywhere close wow, to the way. Wow, that's really interesting so, because that's exactly same the same as age as humans. When, no, but that's the same age when Nim was taken away from adult, or from humans and brought into chimp-to-chimp right. -chimp interaction. Right. Well, well, what what he had to face there was that he'd never been around chimps before, so that was very difficult. But the reality is that that, that year, uh, Nim and I got to know one another, and, and when Herb came back, it it was as if an old friend had come back. Okay. And, and, you know, sometimes a new friend 
is not nearly as important as an old friend. Especially and, when you know what the old friend absolutely. had. I mean, he had a. I mean, it's New clear York in City the film that, that Nim not only recognized her, oh, but yeah. was elated and, and very, very, very happy to see him. And, uh, so much so that it, it almost looks aggressive. Nim looks like he's coming towards Herb to bite him because he has an open mouth face, and, mm-hmm. which is actually— But it's just a big hug. Right, exactly. But Herb didn't quite know that. And as if you watch that carefully, you see Herb first puts his hands out to kind of push watch Nim away because uh, it appears as though there's going to be aggression when, when actually it turns out to be just a great big open mouth kiss and nim is just as happy as he can be to see his old friend uh and and it is sad it, and it was a very sad moment when herb walked over to his car got in and drove away i mean yeah. the next day nim was was crushed even though you wanted to play with him and things oh, yeah. he wasn't into it oh, oh well i he, mean that it, day or yeah well he was it was obvious that that Something had occurred that had jogged his memory. I mean, and so he obviously uh, remembered her, which I, I'm sure. I mean, I can't be certain, but I'm fairly certain that that not only did he start thinking about her, he started thinking about Joyce and Bill and, and New York. I mean, he has memories of all of those things, and it had only been a year. So, uh, so I, I think that we paid extra special attention to him after that, at least for a while, so that he wouldn't spin into a depression that we couldn't yank him out of. Now, one thing, uh, if you see this film, this might, I don't know, jar you a little bit. I thought it was pretty interesting. You smoked marijuana with them. Yeah. And they show uh, it in the film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, yes. Uh, I didn't introduce... He'd already been... <laughs> right. He'd already first been smoking weed was, for quite a while, right. actually. The uh, first woman in this film... In High Times Magazine oh, in I 1975, and we had seen that. As graduate students, we were at the IPS, and, you know, we were... It was the 70s. But the fascinating thing is that you and uh, the other woman that ran, or that was working Elise. at... Elise. Elise. Um, you both say it was... You know, it calmed him down, and... Right? He turned well, like non-violent? Us. Like us. Uh, it, it, there was no it, aggression. It, no, no. Uh, the... Pot is is what it is. I mean, it, it affects chimpanzees in the same way as it affects humans. It, it mellows you out. You t- talk more and relax, and and the kind of things that that uh, foster a relationship. And we didn't smoke with him. It, you know, I mean, it wasn't like we were running out there to get a high. <laughs> no, it doesn't show that I mean, in the it, film. It, it, just... the, the reality is that we were 22, 23, yeah. 24 years old. We mm-hmm. smoked pot. Right. And. Uh, when we went out on walks, if we wanted to pull out a joint and smoke it, we didn't want to exclude Nim. So that if would he be wanted, weird if you did uh, that. Exactly, and then and then the relationship would there, there would be some kind of uh, wow. How come you're getting to do that and I'm not? Right. We wanted to treat him as if he were one of us, just like I say in the film. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is that we treated him just like us. If he wanted to smoke. We handed it to him. If he didn't want it, he handed it to the next person in the circle as, you know, just like uh, you would if you were hanging out with your buddies watching TV and smoking a joint. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a social event, and, and and that's about as far as we took it. Uh, right. No, it doesn't show. It's not a – I'm not demeaning it at all. Oh, oh no. And, and you know, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have allowed James to have that piece of footage if, if I didn't know it was going to be in the film because obviously it's it, – it, it's, uh, it's something that almost everyone asks me about. Uh, I, <laughs> and, and, you know, what's it like? To, I mean, even Joy Bahar on, on The View, when yeah. I was on The View, you she on the asked view? me. Yeah, yeah, wow. actually. And, and, and they were very gracious and very nice. And Joy asked me, uh, so what's it like to get high with a chimp? And I, I laughed and I said, well, it's about the same as getting high with you. And then she <laughs> said, oh, you mean the munchies? And, and you know, so she, get she was willing to, you know, the audience laughed. And, right. uh, uh, I mean, and it's worth a little chuckle, but... In hindsight, I probably would have not done that simply because— You have to uh, answer questions from people like me. Yeah, (laughs) and, well, and and simply because, you know, now that I'm almost 60 years old, I I look at the world a lot differently than I did when I was 24. Sure. So how many years did you get to spend with Nim Chimpsky at Oklahoma? Well— Nim came in 77, and he was in Oklahoma till almost 1983. So, so five years. About five years. And then 
there was a period of time where I didn't get to see him, and then at the Black Beauty Ranch, and then I got to see him again. At right, the end, he was so. taken away for laboratory testing, but it said that he didn't, or I read that he didn't actually get tested on. He was just in this really small cell in a right. science. I mean, it looks, right. it's a miserable well, moment. Well, what for happened him. was in 1982, 83, the Institute for Primate Studies, where Nim was born and where he was residing at the time, had lost its funding, or at least part of the funding, and the chimps were being sold to medical research for to the laboratory for experimental medicine and surgery in primates. And, and actually, you'll meet in the film Dr. James Mahoney, who I think probably is the most powerful person in the film. He says some some stuff that, that you'd be surprised that a lab person would say. I, I, I personally think he's the real hero of the film because he says things that are outside of his realm. And, and what he says is absolutely true. I mean, and when you see the film, I, I think you'll understand. A lot of people say, oh, you're the hero, you're the hero. But that the reality is that, that I don't have to do anything different than I would have normally. Well, from a filmmaking standpoint, though, is the way that you're introduced is right after Dr. Herb Terrace leaves Nim. And then it cuts to you and you say, I'm going to make him as happy as I can. So it paints you as a hero, I mean, as far as film storytelling goes. And, I mean, you obviously... Right, but you have to take that with a grain of salt. This is sure. a film. Exactly. And, and we have not... 93 minutes mm-hmm. to tell a story and and so you have to you have to cut out a little bit here and there and and uh, and that's what happens and and I have to realize that that I'm not a hero I just did for my best friend what he would have done for me under the same circumstances and and, and I didn't see it that way then and and I don't really see it that way now uh, you know, uh, although I, well having spoken to you I've now cleared up a couple of misconceptions I had but Right. Yeah. But again, it is a film, and there is pacing and things like that that have to be accounted for, so things are cut out. Right. Well, there are people that work with NIM that aren't even in the film that, that probably were uh, were pretty disappointed that, that their roles in NIM, their, their role in NIM's life wasn't uh, big enough to actually even make it in the film, and I've even had to deal with that. I've, I've been... Uh, in, at screenings where some of Nim's friends from New York, the ones, the 37 or 40 or so people that worked with him, come to the screening and and uh, ask me questions about, you know, what about this or what about that. But you can't really put everything in a film when when it's only you know 93 minutes right. of a 26 year old life. So let's jump ahead. So he gets put into a lab, uh, laboratory exper- experimental medicine surgery in primates LEMSIP is the name of the organization. But right. he gets out. How long is he in there? Well, he's there probably about two weeks, maybe three weeks a month at the most. Oh, that's good. Uh, I well, thought it was much longer in the film. Well, actually what happened was uh, there was a huge uproar uh, before he left and then when he did leave because other chimps were, were from the IPS leaving as well. So Nim wasn't the only chimp that I was concerned about. There were 40 other chimps there as well that, that I was just as concerned about as Nim. But Nim was the famous one. And Nim was the one that people wanted to write about in the newspaper. Well, it's interesting you say that because the other chimps weren't signing with you. Did you really? I mean, I know you cared for Some them. Some of them were. Were they? Right, right. Okay. So, so our, our, our research included other chimpanzees that, that did learn sign. And even before I got there, there were chimpanzees, a, a, a chimp named Bowie, who uh, ended up at the wildlife way station in the secret network, and uh, several other chimpanzees that Roger had taught sign language before I even had arrived. Okay. So there was quite a, 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 quite a huge language uh, research uh, group going on in terms of chimps there. So uh, Nim's older brother, Ali, for example, was a signer. And he was there. His brother Onan was there. So all of those chimps that were there at the time, I was also as concerned about them because they're all going to Lemsip. Right. So the best way I thought to uh, raise attention was to say, well, Nim is there. And I assumed wrongly that uh, all the chimps would be released uh, if Nim was. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Yeah. Nim stayed for about two weeks to a month. He was returned to Oklahoma for a while, and then he was sold to the Fund for Animals, and which is the Black Beauty Ranch. And they they took just Nim, no other chimp. Yeah, that's another issue that comes up is he's – how long is he – he's in isolation for a while. How long is he basically – I mean he's in a big cage. He's got toys and things, and it looks like he's – 
moderately well taken care of, but well, there's no interaction with humans or chimps, really. Right. The, the interaction was, was uh, amongst people. The people that were running the Black Beauty Ranch were horse people, and, right. and they took care of uh, hoof stock. And so they didn't know anything about primates, and, uh, but they wanted to do the right thing, obviously. They built them a, a nice enclosure. I, I mean, I don't know about nice. Better than where the lab. Right. Yeah, definitely better than the lab. Uh, it's like a however, step forward and a step backward. That's right. what it looks like in the film. And he's alone. That's, so yeah. he has no of none of his old friends, either human or chimpanzee, none of his you know chimpanzee brothers or sisters or the chimps that he'd come to know at the IPS for the five or six years he was there with us. And uh, so I immediately you know started to complain to Cleveland, who's Cleveland Amory, who ran the Black Beauty Ranch, about getting him other chimps. I mean, my idea was, hey, let's get him not only other chimps, let's get all the IPS chimps. And they weren't receptive to that? No, not at all. Uh, and, of course, you have to take that with a historical grain of salt. Uh, unfortunately, in the 80s, uh, we, we still hadn't come to the conclusion that chimpanzees were worth uh, saving and, and that they were sentient beings and all the kind of things that we now appreciate about chimpanzees today. Most of us appreciate it, but there's still some other people out there. Right. Well, uh, sadly, that's true. Uh, right now, there's still a big debate going on in the United States about whether or not we should use chimpanzees in medical research. There are about 937, I believe, is the number held by NIH that uh, – that the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and, and the New England uh, Anti-Vivisection Society and, and the Humane Society of the United States are, are trying right now to, uh, to help to get to sanctuaries. So we're calling on NIH to, to suspend medical research on chimpanzees in the United States and move them all to sanctuary. That stuff's all up in the air right now, and there's, there's quite a bit of contention going on about whether or not we should retire all these chimps or whether they should be moved from one lab to another and that sort of thing. I'm talking to Bob Ingersoll. He is a chimpanzee expert and an advocate for chimpanzees and other animals, I assume. Absolutely. He is featured in the film, the great documentary, Project Nim. I highly recommend it. Um, it's fantastic documentary. It's a lot of historical information that people should be aware of, whether you were alive during the 70s and 80s or you're not. It's very important. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Did you? St- how how long was Nim isolated at the Black Beauty Ranch? Well, Nim lived about a year or a year and a few months at Black Beauty Ranch alone, mm-hmm. and then finally. The fund bought a chimpanzee from the IPS, a, a chimpanzee named Sally, and Sally uh, lived there for about another 10 years with Nim, but no other chimps. And uh, as everyone that's a chimp expert knows, one chimp or two chimps, three, four chimps, that's not really a group. Uh, what what you really need, the more chimps, the better, 20, 30, or whatever. Uh, for example, uh, I have a friend that uh, runs a, a place called Monkey World in, in, in Dorset, England, and her name's Alison Cronin. She has a chimpanzee group with 30-something chimps in it, and from all different uh, backgrounds. Some of those chimps were ex-pets, some of them were ex-lab uh, animals, and she's worked them all into a, a, a chimpanzee group. And, and so uh, so it is possible to put together groups of chimpanzees that hadn't, hadn't known one another or come from varying uh, backgrounds. And, and, and that's what we're hoping will happen with all the chimps that are in captivity in the United States right now. We're hoping that amongst five or six, eight, ten sanctuaries that we hope will eventually come online. There are about five or six right now, uh, but we need a lot more space and, right. and, and funding and NIH and, and Congress. You know, obviously, we have budgetary problems right now. So there's, there's something called the Great Ape Protection Act and cost-saving measure that right now is, is in committee and just come out of committee. There's, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services is now determining whether or not chimpanzees should be uh, – taken from uh, just threatened uh, it, only species in and on the the endangered species list which is uh, a split designation in captivity in the United States chimpanzees are just threatened while they're endangered in the wild mm-hmm. we're hoping that the fish and wildlife service will will change that designation so that chimps won't be able to be used in entertainment in tv commercials and the kind of things that are that that just are 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 not acceptable in 2012 i mean we it, hope anyway i know do you think that there's no way so 
Well, let me let me get back to the so Nim died at 26, which is about half the life expectancy of a healthy chimpanzee, right? Right. So, but the last 10 years he was spending roughly with uh, Sally, you said another chimp in an enclosure, right? And also you got to interact with him. But my question is, he was very large at this point. He was about what 150? Uh, at, well, at the time that uh, well, there, 10 years went by before I got to see him again, and all that's talked about in the film. So from about 1985 or 86 until about. Uh, 1995, I didn't get a chance to see him because I was... Ten years went by. Right. So I was kind of, uh, what, what banished, let's say, or, or not allowed to see them for a variety of reasons. And uh, because I was, you know, I, I was, you know, kind of a problem for the Black Beauty Ranch and for Cleveland Amory because I wanted Nim's life to become better. And so, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, made myself a thorn in their side and they didn't want to see me. But eventually... They they got a guy there that uh, was receptive to chimpanzees' needs, and Sally was was rather old and sick, and I predicted, you know, correctly that Sally wasn't going to live very long, and so uh, Chris Byrne, who ran the ranch at the time, allowed me to come down there in about 1995 and see him again for the first time in 10 years, and once that happened, we we kind of made a plan and started to move in the right direction, getting other chimps for Nim. So how many years did you get to see Nim again before he passed away? Well, I saw him from about 1995 until 2000, so about so another five, five years. years. And right. there's another moment, and this is a scary moment in the film, where the very first woman who interacted with Nim comes back, and she is very, just her nature is very kind of carefree. She was... Not right. the greatest influence on Nim when he was first born, but she comes back and just waltzes into the cage, and Nim almost kills her. Well, what happened was, you know, it was all in the, the press. When mm-hmm. Nim was sold to the Laboratory for Experimental Medicine and Surgery and Primates, it was a big deal. And uh, it was all in New York Times and Washington Post and Boston Globe, which is my hometown uh, newspaper. Uh, and so... Uh, once that all settled and the dust was all settled and Nim moved to the uh, Black Beauty Ranch, Stephanie, I, I believe she was invited to come down there and see Nim again. And like you said, she waltzed right into the cage, and Nim wasn't having any of it. And uh, he, unfortunately for Stephanie, he exerted his physical uh, prowess on her and kind of mopped the floor with her a little bit and uh, didn't didn't actually break any bones, but... Knocked her unconscious. Definitely. Knocked her unconscious, and and it was a very serious situation. So uh, so unfortunately for Stephanie, that wasn't good. What Stephanie didn't know was about a month before that, I'd been there because I just showed up the first time when Nim. The first time I showed up was right after Nim moved there, and mm-hmm. I didn't call or prep them. I just showed up, and I I asked them to go in the cage, which I did, and I spent the next six and a half hours in the cage with him. No problem. That's what I wanted to ask, was after this attack, were you kind of banned from interacting with them physically, or, because they show you in the film only interacting with them through glass at the last five right. years well, of his life. Well, I, I, I believe that I probably could have gone in the cage with Nim, but that wasn't really appropriate. That's not something that we could have sustained anyway, and he the reality so is, not point. only so big, that, that if he didn't hurt me, the the potential for him hurting someone else was so great that that couldn't be that that just couldn't be. Besides the fact that he doesn't really need me, he doesn't need to need physically chimps. be in contact with me, and and that's you know my uh, I'd love to have been able to interact with Nim and get big hugs from Nim and that sort of thing. But that's that was really a selfish need on my part. What we really needed to do and what we all understood was best for Nim was to get him other chimps, and that's what we did, and we did that as as best we could. We were kind of hoping that it would... So by the end of his life, how many chimps was he interacting with daily? We, there were three other chimps with him at the end of his life. Uh, Kitty had died, you know, a few years before that, so there was a chimp... I mean, not Kitty. Sally. Uh, Sally. There was another chimp that we, we uh, arranged to get from the Colston Foundation named Kitty that arrived first, and then we got two other chimps from Lemsep from Jim Mahoney uh, named uh, Midge and Lulu. And those chimps actually are still alive, and they still live at the Black Beauty Ranch. So the three that, that I helped to arrange to be with Nim at the end of his life are still there. So, I mean, one of the big questions of this ending of this film that I had was, did he, when he, when he died, was he happier than, you know, previous moments in his life? I mean, he clearly wasn't as miserable as being in the testing 
facility, but was he fairly happy with, you know, he has three chimps. He's not with humans. You know, it's it's fairly clear that that uh, Nim was depressed when you see him see me for the first time in 10 years mm-hmm. <coughs> in that one scene. And uh, as that scene goes on, you see him actually – his physical self picks up mm-hmm. within the two minutes that right. you watch that film, which is not – that piece of film isn't cut. And, it, and my wife actually, Belle Ball, uh, filmed that uh, in, when it was occurring uh, without breaking, without it uh, stopping it. So what you see is, is Nim realizing that uh, I'm kind of the cavalry, let's say, and, and I've come to – you know, make his life as happy as I could. So uh, it, it was, wasn't as good as it could be. But it was substantially better. And you can see it in Nim's body language in the film. It, it's it's very moving. Quite a few people come up to me and, and actually say, you know, the moment in that film that just tore me up was the moment where he's – well, he does something in the film when he first meets – and sees me first. We we don't quite recognize one another because we're obviously bigger and mm-hmm. older. And and but then when he does realize it's me, he does something. And and I've seen literally hundreds of people come up to me with tears in their eyes, trying to talk to me about that particular moment. And and I don't really have anything else to say. I mean, Dennis Kucinich, the congressman came up to me former congressman right 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 no he's still a congressman is he yeah yeah he's a interesting guy but go ahead he came up to me uh, after a screening that uh his wife works for the physicians committee she's a yoga instructor isn't she involved with like uh health and fitness yeah and and veganism veganism and 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 so uh she arranged for the film to be screened in washington dc and and for me to come and and uh after the screening he came up to me and he didn't say anything what he said was uh, you know i just want to give you a hug and wow. and yeah that's what i think too I, I i think that not only did he get it he got it in a big way and this and film I, hits you one way or another that's why i had to speak to you and speak about the film on the air right it's a fantastic film we're as i figured i knew i'd run through an hour with you pretty quickly we're, we're getting towards the end but um let me see here so so how can people get involved with this? Like, I, I would love to donate money, participate. Well, the first thing you can do is you can get yourself up to speed on what's going on with chimps right now in the United States. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way to do that is to reference some of this material from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine or from the New England Anti-Vivisection Society okay. or the Humane Society of the United States. There are many ways you can interface with that. You can contact me on Facebook, Robert Ingersoll. You, you wrote back immediately, by the yeah, way. Yeah, and I try to do that with everyone because it's very important. I want to help chimps, and I can't do it alone. I need your help. I need you to write to NIH. I need you to call your congressman. I need you to call your senator, and I need you to ask them to support these chimps that we've held in captivity for many, many years. It's our responsibility to help them. It's it's us that put them there, and it's it's going to be us that gets them out of there. If we have resolve, I mean, this isn't going to be easy. It's going to cost a lot of money, mm-hmm. but it's it's what is right, it and, is. And, and that's what I think needs to happen. We need to sit back and examine what it is that's right and then do it. It's very simple. Yeah, so Robert Ingersoll on Facebook, right? Yeah, that's yeah, the, or Bob Ingersoll? Bob Ingersoll and Nim Chimsky uh, on Facebook. Yeah, also. you actually represent Nim Chimsky on, fa- on Facebook. Right, ab- absolutely. I, I'm I like the that. voice of Nim, and, right. and uh, I think he would like that as well. He, 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 was, he was very into getting his picture taken, and, <laughs> yeah. and he, he, he liked the camera. And I think that, that if he were sitting here in the studio, he'd be smiling right now, knowing that, that he's making a difference. Is there any way – this is just a, not that strange of a question, but a person like me can interact. Where could I interact with you know, smaller chimpanzees? No, no that's, that's not something that we ever advocate. No? We, we, what we would rather you it's say is then how can, I, how can I help chimpanzee sanctuaries? Okay. Because the, the, the worst thing you can do to a chimp is to take him away from chimps and to make him think he's a human. Because right. chimps aren't humans. So, uh, and in everyday situation, you don't have guests walk in, you know, interacting at any of these sanctuaries. Oh no, absolutely not. There, there is there is very little, if any, human chimpanzee interaction mm-hmm. on the level that I that you see in the film with me. Right. That that's not something that I, I hope 
that never happens again. It essentially I'm, worked, it, worked right. the opposite way. Right, exactly. I mean, if you really want to work hands-on with chimpanzees, I, I suggest that you uh, check out some of those sanctuaries in Africa that that are taking in orphan chimpanzees. There are many sanctuaries in Africa right now. Uh, the International Primate Protection League actually uh, sponsors uh, quite a few chimp sanctuaries in in. in uh, in Africa, in Kenya, and in the Cameroon, and in several other countries. And if you really want to interact with chimpanzees, the best way to do that is to, you know, quit your job and, and take all your money and go to Africa and help those guys <laughs> because they could really use your help. Right. right now, chimpanzees in the wild are are in severe trouble and may be in our lifetimes uh, extinct. If, Certainly if, hope not. Well, I, I hope not too, but right now the, the, the writing is on the wall, and if we don't do something – Soon, chimpanzees are, are going to be uh, not not on the planet very much longer. Well, that would be a very sad day. I very much hope it doesn't happen. Everybody uh, out there listening, please go see the film. Rent it. Uh, Netflix it however you can. iTunes. Uh, Project Nim. It's a fantastic documentary. Bob Ingersoll was uh, I very much appreciate his time coming in here for the hour. You're listening to KPOO San Francisco. 89.5 FM. We're on uh, kpoo.com as well, and that's most likely how you're hearing us right now. Uh, wanted to let you know, too, we are always uh, accepting donations. That's how we keep our station running. We're a commercial-free station, and if we weren't, I don't know if I would have the ability to, to reach out and have an interesting guest like Bob Ingersoll on as quickly as I did and for as long as I did without any interruptions. Uh, we're also having a fundraiser benefit show uh, this October 21st. This or It's a Sunday in a few weeks. Uh, it's going to be a really fantastic hip-hop uh, show DJ X1 and DJ KK Baby are going to be there from KPOO. I will be there as well. It's at the Mason Social House, 50 Mason Social House, 50 Mason Street, San Francisco, California. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And one other thing from Bob. Yeah, I'm going to be in St. Louis uh, at the end of October. We're going to be screening the film uh, for the St. Louis Vegans uh, uh, Club. And uh, my... Uh, my assistant, uh, Caitlin, and I will be there. We're doing a conference as well, the, uh, a free free animal experimentation conference. You can find out all about that on my Facebook page. So, so if, if you'd like to see the film, if you live in the center of the country, and you, you know, we'll do a Q&A after. So uh, I believe that's October the 26th, which is a Friday, in St. Louis, Missouri. Perfect. Bob Ingersoll, I-N-G-E-R-S-O-L-L. Got it. Uh, and are you a vegan? Uh, yes, I am. See, I've been battling with it for I'm pretty 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 close. I eat I eat eggs in the morning. And I because I came up with this conclusion that if you can get organic chicken cage-free eggs, I know cage-free doesn't mean I don't want to get into we don't have much time, but anyways, I still eat eggs because I feel like first of all, if they're not fertilized, that egg is coming out anyways and it's wasted protein essentially. And uh if you don't eat a huge amount of them, it's not too terrible for your heart. Mm, but the chickens you know, I mean, I, 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 the way I look at it, uh, cage free and organic, though. Yeah, I, I that's, I, yeah, I, I don't really. Of all the it. things to eat, though, animal products, I feel like that is the least harmful for to the animal. That 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 may be true, but uh, then then again, you you realize that that the whole egg industry and the chicken industry is just so. No, it is, but I mean, I'm saying if you really source it, farmers markets and get in touch. There's there's ways. No question, to go about but very it. difficult for most regular folks to do. That's that. true. But but I understand, uh, and we're moving in. It, we're, That's the thing. Vegetarian and veganism is is now something that in our culture we actually get to talk about. I love. When it. I was a kid, we didn't even talk about that. So I mean, like for example, my my assistant Caitlin, she's she's. Uh, only 23 years old, half of her life she's been vegetarian. Wow. Uh, I, you know, uh, so uh, I, I vegan. <laughs> That's it. Final words. Bob, thank you for coming in. Absolutely. We're running out of time here. Uh, you're a deadhead fan, so I'm going to play a... Uh... Yeah, was that further last night? Oh, fantastic. I'm going to play a Grateful Dead song for you. You're listening to KPOO, San Francisco 89.5 FM. I'm Derek Kelly, your host. Thank you for listening in. Coming up is Jay Johnson's Blues House Party, so stay tuned. And I will be rebroadcasting this uh, interview most likely next Monday, so stay tuned for that. Thank you for listening to KPOO.